What's going on, my good people? Mike Hidalgo here. Thank you for joining us on another FCP Euro DIY. Today, we're going to be working on a 2008 Volkswagen Mark V GTI. Today, on the Mark V behind me, we're going to be covering how to do a timing belt and water pump service. We have a Continental kit in front of us, which is available on FCPRO.com. It includes everything you need to do this job, starting with some coolant. We have a new timing belt, the rollers, the belt tensioner, some hardware for our engine mounts, as well as some hardware for our crank pulley. We have a new water pump, a new belt tensioner, as well as a new belt. Now, typically we recommend you do this service anywhere between 80 to 100,000 miles. You don't really want to push it past 100,000 miles. A couple of things to know, as these things tend to get older, the belt, all the lettering will start to fade, it can start to fall apart and crack, and in an extreme case, it will completely tear, causing your motor to interfere with itself, vent valves, the whole nine, it's a bad deal. So, you definitely want to stay on top of that service. Another thing to consider is your water pump. As these get older, they can leak or completely fail, causing you to overheat, so you definitely want to avoid that whenever possible. We always recommend you do both at the same time, since you're in there doing everything together. Serpentine belt is just a bonus along with the tensioner. It's good habit to replace it whenever you're taking it off the motor. But before we get started on this job, let's take a look at some of the tools we're going to need for this DIY. For this job, we'll be using an array of sockets as well as a couple extensions and ratchets starting with, but not limited to, a couple different 18 millimeter sockets. We have three different 16 millimeter sockets varying in half inch, three eighths, and quarter inch. We have a 13 millimeter, we have a 12 millimeter, a 10 millimeter, as well as an eight. We also have a couple uh, off-brand sockets, if we will. We have a 12 point, today we're using a three quarter inch 12 point, but a 19 millimeter 12 point is recommended. We also have a T30 as well as a T25. We have two different M10 triple square sockets, one for our half inch and one for our 3 8 drive torque wrench. Speaking of torque wrenches, you're gonna want one that can do anywhere from six Newton meters all the way to 122 Newton meters. Uh, so we have all three sizes here available from two 3 8 drive and one half inch drive. Same thing goes for our ratchets. We have a half inch drive ratchet, a 3 8 drive ratchet, and a quarter inch drive ratchet. We have a small pick. We have a 17 millimeter wrench, which we'll use for the belt tensioner, as well as a two millimeter hex tool, which we'll use to lock that tensioner in place. We have an eight millimeter hex Allen key for adjusting the belt tensioner. We also have a small set of pliers. We have an Airview vacuum fill system tool available, which we'll link in the description below. We have a Sharpie to mark all our hardware once we torque it down. A small rubber mallet, which we may need to remove the crank pulley. And then some specialty, but not necessarily required tools are power tools. They always come in handy, especially when removing big hardware. And we have these Astro 940, 93 pliers, which help with those constant pressure clamps. And not pictured here, but always needed whenever you're messing with coolant is a catch can, of course, for your coolant. Now that we know what tools we're working with, let's go ahead and get started on this DIY. All right, my good people, before we get started, the first thing and the first order of business here is going to be to A, Make sure your engine is cold before you do this DIY as we are messing with coolant. We're gonna be pretty deep in the motor itself, so you wanna make sure it's nice and cold. From there, we're gonna work on evacuating the coolant from the system. So to help that out a little bit, we're gonna break the vacuum seal by removing the cap on our expansion tank and go ahead and set that to the side. We'll be back up here in a minute, but for now, let's go ahead and hop underneath the GTI and start draining some coolant. Alrighty, before we start draining our coolant, if your vehicle is still equipped with it, you're gonna to wanna to remove your splash shield. It's held on by six T25s. We have three on either side. So we'll start on the driver's side, move over to the passenger side. Then we can just pull the cover back towards us and go ahead and set it to the side. All right, to drain our coolant, we're gonna go ahead and work off of this auxiliary unit here and remove this clamp. We have our catch pan ready to go underneath. I'm gonna use these Astro pliers or specialty tools to remove these clamps. You can use normal pliers as well. This will just lock it into place. I don't have to worry about fussing with it. We're gonna go ahead and let that drain for a little bit. For those of you working at home, more than likely you're gonna be doing this job in the driveway or in your garage. It's a little bit easier, I would argue, which you're gonna see we're gonna come back down to the ground and kind of stay in one spot. But something you can do to help evacuate some more coolant out of the system is take uh, some compressed air or maybe a shop vac in reverse and just blow through the expansion tank and just push the coolant through the system so it drains out even more here. 
at the end of the day, when we remove the pump, we're still gonna lose some more coolant out of the block itself. So while we let this drain, I'll grab some shop air, blow it through the expansion tank, and just flush out the system a little bit more. While we let its coolant do its thing and we have the car up in the air, we're gonna work on removing the passenger side wheel. We're gonna be doing a lot of work through the wheel liner here, which we're also gonna be removing. So starting with the wheel, if your GTI is still equipped, with the protective beauty covers over the lug bolts. Go ahead and pop those out. If you still have your original VW tool, you can use that to pull them out. I'm just gonna use a small 90 degree pick to pull these all out. All right, with that removed, we have five 17 millimeter lug bolts that we wanna zap out. If you're doing this on the ground, you wanna make sure you break these lug bolts free before you raise the vehicle up. So just keep that in mind. If you have an impact, it doesn't really matter. The guns are strong enough to break them free at full torque. Now we can go ahead and pull our wheel off. All right, now that we have our wheel off, let's go ahead and work on removing our fender liner. So let's do that now. So we're gonna focus on removing this lower portion of our fender liner, as well as this plug right here, which is gonna allow us to access one of the engine mount bolts once we get to that point. For the plug, simply pull it out, set it to the side, we'll need that later. Then we have six T25s to remove for the fender liner, four in the wheel well area and two underneath. One T25 located right behind our sway bar end link. Moving to the right, we have another T25. Continuing towards the bumper cover itself, we have two more T25s, one at the end of our lip on the bottom of the bumper, and we have one more here towards the front of the bumper. And now we should be able to pull the fender liner out, and we'll just go ahead and set this to the side. Now we have the underneath of the car pretty much open up to work with. We're gonna go ahead and start by removing a couple items up top here so we can get this timing belt job on the way. Starting with the removal of our charge pipe, it's held on by two quick disconnect clamps, a T30 and an eight millimeter bolt. So we'll start with the T30 first. That T30 is gonna be located right on top of the alternator. Now we can go ahead and tackle the eight mil bolt. That's gonna be over by the radiator support. Then we have two Quick disconnect clamps, one by the firewall, which we'll do first. And go ahead and pull the clip all the way off. While you're up here, you have your mass airflow sensor that's tied in to the top of the charge pipe. Just go ahead and pop that out of the way. Following the charge pipe back down towards the front, we have one more quick disconnect up here by the throttle body. Same thing, go ahead and pull that up. Small screwdriver works well as well. A small pick is what I'm using. Same one we use to remove the beauty covers off of the wheel lugs. Now we have those free. Our next step is gonna to be to simply pull them and separate them from each end and remove the pipe. Starting with the firewall side. Then we can go ahead and do the front side. And then it's just a matter of fishing it out of here. And with that out, we can go ahead and set this to the side. I'm gonna throw it over by the under panel shields that we took off. All right, now we have that charge pipe out of the way. The next step is gonna to be to remove this uh, 90 degree elbow for the windshield washer reservoir fill. And then from there, we'll proceed on to our expansion tank. To remove the fill elbow for the windshield washer fluid reservoir, it is held in place by a 10 millimeter bolt. Go ahead and undo that next. With that 10 mil removed, we can go ahead and lift it up. And then this is gonna separate from the rest of the hose. Just give it a light twist. Careful as these can get brittle over time, especially with all the heat cycles they see. Pull that off and set it to the side. Next, we're gonna move to our expansion tank, starting with undoing the coolant line. We're gonna undo it over by the engine cylinder head side of things. Small clamp here, we'll grab some pliers and separate that. If you haven't already, this mass airflow sensor is routed through the small clip here. Go ahead and undo that as well. We need some pliers to undo that clamp. There we go. Clamp stayed in place but we just pulled the hose off instead. Following back to the tank, we're gonna to wanna to disconnect our electrical connector. Go ahead and press on the release tab up top. It always helps to push it in first and then pull it out. This wiring harness can be popped out of the two locators here on the side of the tank. Just lift them up and set them over for the side so we can access the two T25s that hold this tank in place. Before I pull those, I'm just gonna throw the cap back on in case I need to rotate the tank around, I don't have to worry about anything spilling out of the top. Right, we have T25 right here in this nook near our VIN on the fender. And we have one more tucked over by the firewall. With those two T25s removed, you can then go ahead and pull up your tank. 
there is one more coolant line that attaches to it at the bottom. If you don't want to remove it, there's simply two plastic clips that hold it to the rest of the lines here in the engine bay that you can undo and just kind of swing it over to the driver's side of things. So we're gonna go ahead and do that just so everything stays nice and connected. We'll free that up and swing it over here. With that tank out of our way, we have three more lines that we want to remove. Not mandatory, but it's going to give you a lot of working room, especially when we get to the mounts. We're going to disconnect them from the rail first, and then we can go ahead and disconnect them from the strut tower end if we want. I'm going to take a pig mat. I recommend you have some sort of towel or something to catch some of the fuel that we may see when we undo these clamps here. So with this spill mat in place, I'm not too worried about fuel getting all over our engine bay. We'll use our small pliers and we'll undo these three lines and separate them. If you're worried about mixing these up when you put them back together, you can use a paint pen and mark them. You can do something like one and one. You can do a dot and the dot, and then you can just leave the inner one blank. This one also has a green mark, which signs up with the green mark on the hard line. So as you choose, I'll take our pliers, we'll undo our clamp, slide it back. Sometimes if these have been on there for a long time, you can use your plier to just break the seal. Again, fuel may come out of here. If it's still under pressure, it may squirt out. So just be mindful of that. Watch your eyes, wear safety goggles. For this third line, because it does go to a plastic uh, line, I don't want to risk damaging it. So instead of what I'm going to do is I'll disconnect it from the strut tower end, which we'll show you in just a moment and we'll just let it sit here and we'll swing it over out of our way. To undo the first two lines, you simply push in on the plastic tab here, and then you can push down and pull back up to release them, which I do my best without blocking the view too much. Just down and up. Here's that better look at that tab. When you push it, it disengages the lock and then you can pull it up. We'll do the same thing with the next one which has been popped out of its home here. And then last but not least, we have our fuel line. So again, expect some fuel to come out of that. We'll go ahead and separate these two from that line that's staying behind. And we'll, for the fuel line, you're gonna wanna push down, but pull this plastic tab up towards the metal fitting on the line. We'll show you that a little bit better once I pull it off. Here's that plastic fitting. You're gonna pull up on it towards the metal fitting and then it'll release. This last line, we'll just go ahead and take it and kind of tuck it in over here. It shouldn't be in our way too much and we can go ahead and let that be there. We have one more line to remove. There's a clamp here that holds it and it goes in front of our timing cover. Again, you can do this job without removing it, but it's just one less thing to get in our way. I'll grab my Astro tool. And this is Astro 94093. If you're looking to get one yourself, comes with a bunch of different attachments. We're gonna go ahead and break that seal. I'm just gonna use these pliers. This line, we can just go ahead and swing it back, tuck it behind our intake pipe over here, and forget about it for now. With that removed, we now have a better view of our timing cover, which is held in by two bolts. We'll go ahead and grab our socket and get ready to remove that next. We have two T30s to remove at the top of our timing cover, as well as one electrical connector. We'll go ahead and zap the T30s out. This is also a great way, while it does involve a bit of work from up top here, if you just want to check the timing belt, maybe you just got the vehicle and you're not sure when it was done, this is a way to go ahead and pull it off and at least give it a quick visual inspection. With our two T30s off, we have an electrical connector to undo right here. Similar to the one on the expansion tank, you're gonna to wanna to press on the tab. I recommend you push in and then pull out. And we'll just tuck that over here underneath the intake manifold. And with that, we should be able to pull our cover towards us and up. You can see this one's been taped together in the past. These tend to break sometimes if you pull them out a little haphazardly. With that off, we now have a way better view of our timing belt from the outside. You know, it's a bit faded, starting to get a little bit shiny, but nothing terrible. We can go ahead and take a flashlight to it. Let's check it out on the inside. It looks in, to be in fairly good condition. The tensioner doesn't look too old. So probably it was done at some point, but we're gonna go ahead and do it anyways. 
All right, next on our laundry list, it's gonna to be to work on locking our tensioner and removing our serpentine belt. You can use a drill bit or a small old lock pin if you have it, but the key is to drive it through here and lock it into the housing right there. I have a two millimeter hex bit, which I'm gonna use. Using a 17 millimeter wrench at the top here should be more than enough to be able to go ahead and rotate that tensioner. It's gonna look something like that. And then we'll feed a two millimeter hex bit through the opening in the front. Send it through like that. And here's a better view at that tool locking the tensioner. This is necessary so we can A, remove the belt and B, remove the tensioner as our kit comes with a new one. Overall, this belt's in pretty good shape, but since we have a new one, we're gonna go ahead and replace it. But it does have a Conti Tech, which is nice to know that someone put in a good belt in the past. Hopefully this thing's had a good life. Up top here we have two 13 millimeter bolts. We have one more down below which we'll get to next, but let's start with the easy ones. 13 millimeter socket. We'll go ahead and zap those out. All right, and then let's get ready to do the one below. For the last 13 millimeter bolt, we're gonna climb in from underneath the wheel well. We have an easy access to the lower 13 and you can grab it with a socket or a wrench. Now we can go ahead and fish out our tensioner and just set it to the side. Still in good shape, but we're still gonna go ahead and replace it. Now we're gonna go ahead and set our engine to the top dead center. I have a socket on my ratchet. We'll go ahead and rotate the motor. I'll get out of your way so you can see a better view of what this engine at top dead center looks like. But we have our crank pulley lined up with our timing mark down below. And we have our cam gear lined up with the timing mark on the plate behind it. All right, my good people. Next on our list is to remove the crank pulley. It's held in by six M10 bolts. There's two ways to do this. One is if you have a 12.19 millimeter wrench or a three quarter inch 12 point wrench, you can put it on your crank bolt like this. And then oftentimes what I like to do is I just rest it up against the axle and I use that to kind of hold the crank from moving. I don't have one of those wrenches with me today. But what I do have is the big old Milwaukee with an M10 socket on it. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do is use this to zap them out. That'll A, make it nice and quick, and B, that'll keep the crank pulley from spinning around on me. So the most important thing, whether you're using a wrench or an impact or an electric ratchet or a regular ratchet, whatever your move is, you wanna make sure that the end of your bit is fully seated all the way into your bolt. The last thing you want to do is strip one of those, and then you're going to be in a world of pain. So secure the bit all the way in, use whatever method you want to use, as long as that is fully seated. Now we have removed the crank pulley bolts, we can go ahead and pull it off. If it's stuck on there, you can use a rubber mallet to go ahead and pop it off. There we go. Now that we have our crank pulley off, we can work on removing our engine mount so that then we can remove this timing cover and proceed with this wonderful timing belt and water pump DIY. So let's go ahead and get ready for that. All right, my good people, we're getting to the point where this car is gonna pretty much stay ground level for the rest of this DIY, but there's a couple of things I wanted to note, mainly just one important one is supporting the engine once we remove that engine mount. You can do it one of two ways. You can use a brace above and between the two fenders, or you can use a floor jack. Most people are gonna use a floor jack at home. I know I would do the same, and I'm gonna do that here today. So what I wanna talk about is how to support it from underneath the motor. So you can put a hole in your oil pan. I have a 12 inch two by four piece of wood, and my goal here is to lie this across the bottom of the oil pan, and then use my floor jack so that it distributes the weight evenly, and I don't risk putting a hole in this oil pan. So pretty straightforward, piece of wood across the whole oil pan if possible, the floor jack, keeps everything nice and happy. All right, now we're gonna go ahead and start on working to remove our engine mount. Uh, normally we're gonna start from up top and then work our way to the mount that goes into the block. One thing I'm gonna do while I have this car on the lift is simply get this 16 millimeter bolt out first so that one, we can give you a good view of it versus having me and Mark lie on the ground with the camera. So we're gonna go ahead and zap that out. It's still being held in by two. Nothing's gonna be hurt. If you're working along at home, Start from the top and work your way over to the side. But again, this is just to give you a better visual and we're lucky enough to have the lift here. So this one's a 16 down here and then we'll go ahead and jump back up top and continue as normal. Another thing to know about the bottom 16 is 
This is the shortest bolt out of the three. So when you pull the other two out, you'll notice they're much longer than this one, making it a little bit easier to know which goes where. Up top here first, we're gonna start by removing the two 13 millimeter bolts that hold the bracket for the elbow on our windshield washer reservoir. 13 on the old 3 8 ratchet. Break both of them free. Also important to note, we already have the floor jack situated uh, underneath the motor with that piece of wood like we showed you. So that way, I literally just have it to the point where it's just matching the load of the engine weight on the mounts. We're not jacking it up and we're not letting it drop yet. Our mounts are held on by two 16 millimeter bolts that hold the mount to the body of the car. And we have two 18s that hold the mount to the side mount that goes directly into the block. I'm gonna zap these out using the impact, but a regular breaker bar or half inch ratchet should do the trick, no problem. We can now grab our 18 millimeter and zap out the two 18s. With all those loosened up, we can go ahead and pull our mount out and just set it to the side. Again, we have new hardware for these that came with our kit. And it's a great time to inspect your mount as well. See if you have any cracking or any failing. This one looks fairly new. Looks like it was replaced not too long ago, so should be good to go. With that, we have three remaining bolts that hold this engine mount to the block itself. And you saw we went ahead and jumped the gun on the lower one, the lower 16, when we had the car up in the air still. You can easily access it now. Matter of fact, you can drop the engine in here and access it even easier for those of you working strictly on the ground. Now I'm gonna use that access plug on the inner wheel well to access our second bolt. And once we have that one out, we'll jack up the motor and access the final third one and pull this out. So follow me into the wheel well, we'll grab a long extension and we'll zap that middle bolt out. All right, we have our 16 on an extension going in through this access plug. Then we'll go ahead and just zap it out with the gun. With that 16 removed from the access plug or via the access plug, now we're gonna go ahead and jack up our engine a bit so we can get a socket on the final bolt and then we'll pull both of our bolts out and the whole rest of the mount. For our final one, we'll just use the ratchet. I have a half inch drive ratchet that I'll use with this socket trick there. You're going to have to jack up the engine a bit. This thing's pretty bulky, but once you have it up enough, you can just go little by little. It's going to stress anything out too much. You'll be able to wiggle this thing out from the top. There we go. All right. With that mount out of our way, we have seven T30s that hold the lower timing cover on. So we'll go ahead and start with those. Now that we have six of the seven T30s removed, there's one more sneaky one back here we can pull off the seventh one and then we can pull this cover off. The moment we've all been waiting for. This cover can come off. Mold debris there, no problem. We'll clean this up after the fact. Now we have a better view of our timing belt and water pump, tensioner, rollers, all the good stuff that we're here to change. All right, my good people, we are one step closer to removing our belt. A couple of things I wanna talk about now that we have it off is one, Note, if anything has moved, mainly just using your timing mark up here on the cam gear. Everything looks fine. We know this hasn't turned at all while we were working on it, so feel pretty confident about that. The next thing we wanna look at is the belt tensioner itself. Now, these are this is something that I've personally struggled to see whenever looking this up, and it's how these are lined up when it's uh, all tight and in place, if you will, when it's loading or when it's making tension on the belt properly. So there's two things you wanna look for. One is this small little dimple that sticks out at the bottom of the tensioner. We'll show you this on the new one as well. But when it is in place, there is a notch right up above it that you can see right in there. That notch is like a small square that's cut out. When that is lined up with that lower dimple down there, that's when you know your tensioner is in a good place. And then lastly, down at the bottom, since we no longer have our crank pulley, we don't really have a timing mark down there to go off of. So what I'm gonna do is clean that up a little bit and then I'll use one of the notches on the crank and mark it against the case so that I can use that as a reference when I go to put everything together to make sure nothing has moved. So let me grab a little bit of brake clean. We'll clean that up a bit and we'll make one last nice mark before we start taking everything apart. All right, my good people, for you to take one last look before we take this belt off, there is our final mark down at the crank pulley. You can see I just notched the block with the paint pen and the one um, 
notch on the crank itself. So again, more insurance, doesn't cost anything to do that, nice and easy. Now we can go ahead and start by removing our tensioner. We have a 13 millimeter nut that holds that in place. Before I remove the nut fully, I'm gonna release tension from the belt using an eight millimeter Allen key or hex bit, whichever one you have will work. And pull that nut off all the way. Now we can go ahead and pull our belt off. To remove the tensioner, you simply pull it out, but you'll notice there is an ear that sits in uh, this freeze plug on the side of the block. When we install a new one, we wanna make sure that stays there. And that's what allows this to rotate and move around so that we can cam it and tighten the belt. Now we're gonna work on removing our rollers. I'm gonna replace them as I remove them as they're a little bit different and I don't want to mix them up. The top one is held by a 13 millimeter bolt. We'll go ahead and break that free. And here is our old one. Still rolled pretty nicely. We have our new one right next to it. They look identical. We have a Scheffler INA roller. We're gonna go ahead and reuse this bolt. We'll go ahead and place that there. Get this bolt started by hand. We'll snug it up very gently with the ratchet. And then we're gonna torque it down to 25 Newton meters. There we go, doesn't take a whole lot. Now moving down below to the next roller. That one is held in by a 12 millimeter socket. So a slight socket change here. This lower roller comes with its own new 12 millimeter bolt, which is nice. So I'll go ahead and pull that out. I'll get this new one started by hand. Again, 12 millimeter socket for that. Light snug with the ratchet. And then we'll grab our torque wrench. And that one gets torqued down to 35 Newton meters. So again, slightly different. There we go. All right, moving on to the water pump, my good people. We have three 10 millimeter bolts that hold that into place. Two are exposed up top here. One's hidden down below. One thing to note, when you pull this out, you may lose some more coolant. So have a catch pan or something ready to go. So three 10 millimeter bolts, let's get to it. With those three tens removed, now we can work on pulling our pump out. Here's our old pump. O-ring was starting to get pretty flat, so it's definitely a good thing that we changed it. Otherwise, it looks to be in good shape. There was no coolant coming out of the weep pole, which is great. That is another failure point on these pumps as they get old. Now we have our old pump out. We can go ahead and install our nice new one, shiny metal impeller. Love to see it. It's a HEPU pump that comes with a kit. Make sure you install it in the same orientation that the old one came out. This stud that our timing cover threads into is on the inboard side, if you will, on the center of the block. We'll go ahead and place it in. It always helps to lubricate the O-ring a bit with some coolant. Uh, if you don't want to use that, you can use a slight dab of dielectric grease. It won't deteriorate the seal in the long run, and it'll make install a little bit easier. Here we go. Rotating it in as you push it in kind of helps the seal A, not get pinched, and B, sink into place. We'll take our same hardware and get those started by hand next. All right, just a very gentle snug. And now we'll grab the torque wrench. We're gonna torque these three 10 millimeter bolts down to 15 Newton meters. Beautiful. All right, my good people, we are gonna go ahead and install our new belt tensioner, but something I wanted to highlight on the old one first was just the lineup marks, just so that it's nice and clear when you install your new one. If you look closely over here, you can see we have this square cutout, which is what I marked when everything was still in place. And then we have this tiny baby square that protrudes on this lower portion right here. The key is that, the key is to have these two lined up once this is tensioned. And that'll show you, A, you're not over tensioning or under tensioning the belt. Everything's lined up properly and it looks good. With that said, we can go ahead and install our new tensioner. Again, this portion right here goes into the freeze plug portion of the block, keeps everything lined up, allows you to adjust everything and move it accordingly. And there should always be a washer here first. Apply our washer. Then we'll loosely start our nut. And that's gonna be a locking nut, so that's as far as we get for now. Now we have our tensioner loosely installed. We're gonna go ahead and get our belt in place. 
And now down below, I'm gonna get down low there. You'll see from up above, and I'm gonna see if I can line those two notches up. If I need to, I can rotate this. Uh, I believe that would be less tension right there. Now we have our belt in place. We're gonna go ahead and tighten down this nut to 25 Newton meters. So we'll grab our 13 millimeter socket. We'll grab our torque wrench and we'll get ready to go on that. And now we're gonna go ahead and rotate the crank twice, paying attention to the mark down there and the mark up here and making sure that they line up. There's one full rotation on the crank, 180 on the cam. And that is what we wanna see my good people. We have our marks lined up down there. We have our marks lined up up top. Go ahead and give it another rotation if you wanna be extra sure, but we just did a full two crank rotation and a full one cam rotation. Um, I'll go ahead and give it one more just to be safe, but I'm pretty happy with how that looks. Now we have our timing belt in and our tension is secured. We can go ahead and install our lower timing cover. We've gone ahead and given it a light scrub. We even went ahead and marked that arrow a little bit brighter so that we can see that when we install everything. Let's simply place it down into place. Pretty much helps installs. Then we'll grab our seven T30s and get those started. We're just gonna go ahead and snug these up by hand, but for those of you following along, if you wanna torque them, the torque spec for these T30s are eight Newton meters. So not a whole lot. Definitely something you can do with the old calibrated wrist. All right, now we can go ahead and install the first part of our motor mount. We have our engine jacked up still. We're gonna go ahead and feed this bulkier uh, side that goes towards the firewall in first, kind of resting up against these AC lines. It's a bit of a tight fit, but for those of you who have done this, this job before, you know it's pretty tight. Now we can grab one of the 16 millimeter bolts, feed it in. We'll grab our 16 mil socket and just get that bolt started by hand first. All right, that's loose enough where we can move everything still. And we'll go ahead and feed the second bolt in from up here if we can. If not, we'll go through our access hole in the wheel liner. But we may be able to get it in here. Yep. Now we have that semi lined up with those two bolts. I'm gonna lower the engine down a bit just so I can get that other bolt hand tight through the access plug. And then from there, I'll lower the engine down a bit more and I'll get the last short uh, 16 millimeter bolt started by hand underneath. And then we'll go ahead and torque them one at a time. We'll work our way down back up. So for now, we're just gonna go ahead and lower the engine a bit until we can see the second bolt. And we'll just go through the access plug. We'll get that started by hand. I'll reach underneath and I'll get this bottom 16 started by hand as well. And then once we have it back up in the air, we'll give this one the final torque in the air. While I have the access plug available for that second bolt, I'm gonna go ahead and torque that down next. But we're gonna torque all three of these engine mount bolts down to 45 Newton meters. There's one. Now I'm gonna go ahead and jack up the engine once again so we can access the top bolt. Beautiful. And then now we can work on installing the top portion of our mount once we get back underneath, we'll tighten down that lower 16. Now I'm gonna go ahead and get the top portion of our engine mount started. We'll feed our two 18 millimeter bolts in first. Just to make sure those start. I'm gonna briefly use the impact to snug these down just a bit, but enough, leave them loose enough that I can adjust the mount around a bit. And that's good there. Now we can go ahead and lower our engine back down so that we can line up the holes for our two 16 millimeter bolts. With that close enough where we can still move it around a bit, we'll go ahead and get these two 16s fed in by hand first. And then we'll just snug them up briefly with the impact again. For this portion, we wanna to try to keep the marks similar to when we pull the engine off. So we'll go ahead and make sure this mount is still parallel to the block. There we go, that's more like it. Now we can go ahead and torque everything down. We're gonna go ahead and torque both of these 16 millimeter bolts down to 40 Newton meters. Now we'll go ahead and torque our 18s down to 60 Newton meters. Now we can reinstall our bracket. 
Again, this is a bracket that holds the neck on the windshield washer reservoir, held in by two thirteens, which we're going to torque down to 20 newton meters. Next, before we start buttoning anything up, we're going to raise the car back up or climb underneath for those of you at home, and we're going to reinstall our crank pulley with our new hardware. That way we can button up the serpentine belt and tensioner. So let's go ahead and do that next. All right, we're gonna go ahead and tighten down that 16 for the third lower engine mount bolt that we talked about earlier. We're gonna go ahead and torque it down to the same 45 Newton meters. Beautiful. Now we have that bolt all situated. We can go ahead and install our crank pulley. One thing to note, which you may have heard me talk about earlier, but there is a hole for a dowel. That is right there. We wanna make sure that dowel lines up with our pulley. That looks nice there. We have new hardware that comes with our kit. We'll go ahead and get these M10 started by hand. We have the pleasure of torquing these all down to 20 Newton meters plus an additional 90 degrees, which is the main reason why you wanna replace them. They are torque to yield bolts. All right. So the torque wrench pretty much got them all to 20. Now what I'm gonna do is just mark all of them and we'll go ahead and rotate them a quarter turn. That's how we're gonna get our 90. There are tools out there that you can use specifically to do uh, angle reading and some electric torque wrenches have that feature as well. All right, I'm gonna use my ratchet to counter hold. Now I'm not too worried about breaking the crank bolt free. It's a low torque setting. If this was a higher torque setting for those bolts, I would not necessarily maybe want to use a ratchet, but a wrench will work just as fine. Again, it's a 12 point uh, 19 millimeter socket or a three quarter inch socket will work as well. 12 point, of course, but we'll use the ratchet. I'm going to wedge it between the control arm and the axle so it doesn't spin on me. Now I'm going to go ahead and give these an additional 90 degrees. I might have to rotate them a bit as I go around. All right, my good people, back up top of things, we're gonna go ahead and install our upper timing cover once more. We're just gonna feed it in gently. Tricky part is getting it under that sensor there. But once we get that there, it kind of keys in to the lower timing cover over here. And it should pretty much sit into place. Then we can grab our two T30s and get those started. And for the record, our marks did line up again, that top that center up there and for what it's worth, the crank one down there on our timing cover once more. So these we're gonna snug up as well, but these are actually a little bit different. These are 10 Newton meters versus the eight for the lower cover. These two bolts are a little bit bigger, a little bit longer, but otherwise very similar. Now that we have the timing cover secured, we're gonna go ahead and install our belt tensioner. We're going to be reusing the same hardware for this one. Obviously the new tensioner comes pre-locked so that we can do all the hardware first and then we'll unlock it and do our belts last. We're just going to grab our 13 millimeter socket and our ratchet and we'll just go ahead and gently snug them up. While I have you under here, we're going to go ahead and install our final 13 millimeter bolt for the belt tensioner. And now we can go ahead and torque it down to 30 Newton meters along with the other two when we go back up top. We're also gonna go ahead and route the belt on the crank pulley and AC compressor pulley while we have it available to us right here. Okay. All right, we have it over the alternator, over the crank pulley. Now we'll go back up top and we'll undo the tensioner so this can be nice and taut. All right, now back up top, we have our belt routed. We're gonna go ahead and use our 17 millimeter wrench to remove the locking pin on our tensioner so that it can tension up the belt. And we'll take our 17 right up here, nice and easy on this notch. We're gonna push towards the radiator for a moment so we can then remove this locking pin and we'll slowly release it. And beautiful, that is ready to rock and roll. While I have you here, we're gonna work on connecting our hose that we ended earlier. Oh, in addition to, we're gonna go and grab this connector that we tucked under the manifold. Tuck, plug that in first while we have a good view of everything. There we go. Make sure that clicks in nicely, beautifully. 
Now we can bring our hose over and we can grab our pliers and get these ready to rock as well. Start with the middle one. Remember we did dot to dot. That's on the barbed fitting there. And we'll do the most forward one. Keep in mind when you go to start this again, you're gonna have to build up that fuel pressure. So don't be concerned if it doesn't start instantly. Now we have those three situated there. We wanna go ahead and plug them back in over here to their perspective ends. We have our fuel line, which we'll start with first. And simply push it on all the way. Listen for that satisfying click. It's not going anywhere. Next, we have our green one. Beautiful, and then our third one. Beautiful. And go ahead and tuck this back in where it was. Now we have those three lines situated. I'm gonna go ahead and swing our expansion tank back over and we'll feed it through those two clips that hold the line in place. Pull up our wiring harness so we can tuck those two T25s back in there. Then we can tuck it back into the expansion tank grooves here that lock it into place. We'll go ahead and connect our expansion tank overflow line back to that metal fitting. Get that pliers ready to go. Again, the line's a little bit swollen, so the clamp stayed with the line, but as long as we get it into place and release the clamp. Now we can go ahead and plug in our coolant level sensor once more. Following our windshield washer reservoir elbow, we can go ahead and reinstall that once again. And we'll grab our 10 millimeter bolt and get that situated back into place here. Then we'll just grab the 10 millimeter on the socket and snug that up. It's just holding the elbow here so it doesn't need a whole lot of torque. Now we can go ahead and install our charge pipe. We're gonna go ahead and feed it under this AC line. We'll go ahead and make sure it joins itself up here as well. That looks good, that looks good. Before we attach those clips, we can go ahead and install our eight mil and our T30 quickly. Now we can install our quick disconnect clips that hold these two lines together. And we'll do the same with the top one. There we go. Nice and locked in. This mass airflow sensor can be routed back into the two retaining clips that hold it. One on that expansion tank cooling line under the foot strut. And one little grommet right there. Now that we have this buttoned up, our next move is gonna be to button up the wheel well. We'll go and install our fender liners, our plug for one of those engine mount bolts. We'll throw the wheel on, and then we'll wrap it up with filling up our cooling system. All right, my good people, back underneath the wheel well, we're gonna install our plug once more. That gives us access to one of the engine mount bolts. Simply press in the center of these, and they clip right in. Now we're gonna grab our fender liner and position it back into place. We're gonna go ahead and snug these four T25s up before we head underneath. We have two more underneath the bumper. While I have you here, my good people, we're just gonna throw our wheel back on so we can raise and lower the car as we need to. But don't worry, we're not gonna put it down just, just yet. We'll come back to that when we're done with everything else and we'll give them a final torque. But for now, let's go ahead and get back underneath the GTI. We'll reattach our coolant line and then we'll wrap it up with the splash shield under there. Back underneath the GTI, we're gonna go ahead and reconnect our coolant line. We'll start by gently feeding it into place. We'll get our hose clamp open, ready to go. Some would say with arms wide open. Then we'll go ahead and get the clamp situated, tucked right back in there. And then we'll grab our shield, starting by feeding it into the front of the bumper first. And we'll install the six T25s that hold it together. Now that our belly pan is in place, we can lower the car down and get ready to fill it with some coolant. All right, my good people, back up top, our last thing to do here is gonna be to vacuum fill the system. So we're gonna go ahead and remove our cap from our expansion tank. We have our air compressor hooked up, ready to go. We have our vacuum fill system right here. We won't worry about the end of the hose just yet, but we'll go ahead and get it set up. Attach our airline. I also like to have a small towel sometimes. 
while we the system is pretty much empty, sometimes it'll pick some coolant up and it'll kind of uh, aerate out of this end here. So you wanna make sure your system's as empty as possible before you use one of these. You wanna get it up to 25 on the gauge and just let it sit for a few minutes. As long as that gauge or that needle does not drop, then we know that the system's nice and airtight. So we'll give it a couple seconds, or in this case, a few minutes, a couple seconds for you good people, and then we'll get to it. All right, at this point, it's been a few minutes. Our vacuum is holding. It is completely normal to see your coolant lines collapse when you're pulling vacuum on the system. As it fills in with coolant, they will go back to normal size, so don't be worried about that. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the end of our line here and feed it into our coolant bucket. We have a 50-50 mix of the coolant and distilled water. Always recommend distilled water if you have access to it. We're gonna go ahead and just purge the line and by that we're just gonna fill it with coolant for a brief moment and then cap it back up. And then I'm just gonna press the vacuum button one more time to just kind of expel that little bit of air that we just introduced through the line. Beautiful. Now I'm gonna keep one hand on the hose so that it stays at the bottom of the bucket. I'll keep eyes on that in case we need to get more coolant and we can go ahead and open this valve and just let the system self fill. All right, my good people, at this point, what we'll do is we're gonna start the car up. We'll let it get to temperature. We'll make sure the coolant level gets to the right spot on the expansion tank. If we need to suck some out, we'll suck some out. If we need to add some more, we can always add some more, but basically we're just gonna let the vehicle burp itself and then take it for a test drive. But before we forget, let's give that wheel its final torque and wrap up this DIY. Back down on the ground, our last bit of homework here is to torque down our wheels. We have our torque wrench set to 90 foot pounds or 122 newton meters. And then we'll install our beauty covers back over these lugs. And with that, my good people, that's gonna conclude this DIY for today. Overall, a little bit of a lengthy job, about four hours if you're not filming like we are today. Make sure you have a friend and some snacks when you do this DIY. If you like this video, please be sure to give it a thumbs up. If you have any questions or comments on what we did today or there's a specific job you wanna see us do on the Mark V, leave those in the comment section below. And if you like this DIY and you wanna see more like them, please consider subscribing. We make new ones all the time. As always, thank you so much for watching. We'll catch you on the next one.